Well, happy Father's Day once again. I pray that uh, everybody is fired up to be here this morning. Thank you so much to our brother James sharing for communion and our brother Angel who shared for contribution. And uh, there appears to be a theme is that in the last month you may have been tested by God in your faith. You know, today, because it's Father's Day, you know, Mother's Day is a little different, right? Mother's Day is a day uh, to honor the moms who work hard. They're, they're so compassionate. They're so nurturing. Today's Father's Day. It's a day for the men, okay? It's a day for the men, which means I'm not going to give you a sermon today. I'm going to give you a lecture, okay? In honor of Father's Day, get ready for your lecture this morning. You know, I'm a, I'm a physical father, amen. I have two wonderful kids. I have a five-year-old son named Ethan. He's amazing. And I have a three-year-old daughter. It was her birthday. Actually, th this week, she turned three years old. And, of course, she's our precious little baby girl right there. And uh, there's nothing quite like being a dad. I really don't know how to describe it. It's a feeling where as soon as your child is born, it just kind of like kicks in. And you start to realize that God has this plan for you that is so much bigger than yourself. And you can't really live your life for yourself if you are a dad. Today, of course, is a special day. We do traditionally honor today as Father's Day, and we should be celebrating our dads. Celebrating our dads. Now, you may have felt like you had a great relationship with your dad. You may have felt like you didn't have a great relationship with your dad. Maybe your dad wasn't in your life the way that you wanted. But I guarantee you that there is something that you can honor him for, whether it was a good relationship or a poor one. And I know that if you're here with a church this morning, that there is a spiritual father in your life. And what we want to dive into here today in the scriptures is what does it mean to be a father? You know, what we learn in the Bible is that this is an incredibly important role. And roles are not given to us by man, but they are given to us by God. The role of a father, the role of a dad is given and ordained by God. It is not a culturally derived role. It is a role that comes from our Father, the Creator, and the Author of life. Our culture increasingly devalues the role of a man and the role of a father. And I don't believe that that's just a coincidence. You know, in Matthew chapter 26, Jesus warned the disciples he said, it is written, strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. God very clearly says in the Bible that it is the father who is the head of the family. Which means that Satan, in order to destroy the family, must strike the head. He must strike the father. I believe that Satan has tried to destroy the family by attacking our dads. And by attacking men. The father is said by God to be the leader of his family. The role of the father is an essential role in the family and in society. You cannot remove it and have a healthy family. We have to protect our fathers. It's crucial. It's the role of the protector, of the provider, the father is to instill emotional strength and moral courage into the family. Wisdom, guidance, skill, aptitude, discipline. These are the things that come from our dads. I believe that true fathers are committed men, sacrificial men, hardworking men, strong men, men who are ready to do whatever is necessary for the family. Are these not things that we should honor in our families? I believe that it is the father who is the hero of the family. They get to be the knight in shining armor. 
That is the role that God has given them. Of course, Satan wants to turn our dads into, and men really, into couch potatoes, right? That won't uh, put down the beer to take care of their family. That won't take responsibility or that will deflect the responsibility and give it to someone else. And oftentimes, they try to give it to the woman. But these are things that destroy the role and then have an effect on the family. And I believe Satan is behind these things. So for our lecture this morning, the title is Three Important Lessons from Our Heavenly Dad. Go to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Three important lessons from our heavenly dad. Point number one is determination. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Point number one is determination. You know, I believe that the word determination is a mixture of two qualities. Number one is perseverance. In verse two here, it says that we must run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Verse one. And then right after that, it says fixing our eyes on Jesus, which is the second quality in determination is focus. You know, I believe that these are qualities that men are given by God. Endurance, perseverance, strength. And focus. These are manly qualities. The Bible tells us to throw off everything that hinders and the sin that easily entangles. Which means that there's a distinction. As you run the race marked out for you, there's a distinction between what hinders and what is sin. And oftentimes the enemy tries to convince us that if it's not sin, you should keep it. No, if it's sin, you should repent. If it's not sin and it hinders, you throw it off. You get rid of it. If anything endangers the family, you get rid of it. If anything even looks like it might slow down what God is trying to get you to do in the race that he's marked out for you, you get rid of it. The calling of a father. Fixing your eyes on Jesus, it is a focus. It is a will that cannot be shaken from putting your eyes on the author and perfecter of life. This is the one that makes us mature, Jesus Christ. You know, I'm I'm reminded of John chapter 14 where Philip says to Jesus, Jesus, How can we see the Father? How can we know the Father if we've never seen him? And Jesus says, Philip, you do know him because you know me. When you fix your eyes on Jesus Christ, it allows you to see your Father. And then he becomes your role model. Who do you imitate in your life? The Bible says in verse 3, consider him, consider Jesus, so you will not grow weary and lose heart, heart, courage, faith, zeal. These are qualities of a father. Do not lose heart. You know, I'm reminded of when I was a child and the role that my father played in my life, and and maybe you can relate to this uh, as a father or as a child, a son or a daughter. And I believe there are moments in your life where Your father teaches you things that although they are simple things, they require great love and compassion and perseverance in order to teach you. When I was five years old, my dad taught me how to ride a bike. Does everybody in here know how to ride a bike? There's about half of the group here. Amen. If you want to learn how to ride a bike, 
Talk to me after church. I'll teach you how to ride a bike. I was five years old, and my dad put me on the bike. And what does a dad do when he's teaching his son how to ride a bike? Well, he holds the seat. He guides the bike. He helps it to stay stable because you're still learning how to keep it stable. And he guides it, and he runs alongside you as you are on the bike so he can teach you how to ride it. Now, if you can't figure it out the first time, does your father just give up on you? He does it again, and he does it again, and he does it again. And his goal is not to prevent you from being hurt necessarily. His goal is simply to instruct you, to teach you how to do it on your own. In fact, it's implied that in learning, you actually may hurt yourself. In fact, there was a time when I was learning to ride the bike that I actually hit a bump, and I flew over the handlebars. And I landed right on my chin. And apparently this is a common thing. I think I've met many people who have gone through a similar experience learning to ride a bike. And I landed on my chin, and in this moment, I, I actually split my chin open. And now my dad, who was teaching me how to ride the bike, had to take me, bring me into the house, help me wash and clean the wound. And then when he saw how bad it was, he had to bring me to the emergency room. He had to be there for me as the stitches were put in my chin. And then for the next two weeks, I had to heal from what happened to me. Now, do you think my father said, oh man, that was really painful. I, I hope you never ride a bike. Do you think as I cried over my hurt chin that my dad also cried? No. He taught me how to bear the pain so I could learn how to ride a bike. He was patient, and he was there with me, and he helped to teach me. I believe that this is what God does for us. We have to ask ourselves, what hinders our spiritual race? What is it? If you are running a race and you have things tied to your legs, you have to cut them off. Otherwise, you can't run the race. What is it in our life that the enemy puts around our legs to try to prevent us from running the race that is marked out for us? We have to get rid of it. How, are it, how is our endurance? When I was in track and field, I was a short distance sprinter. In fact, I, I hate running more than 100 yards. I ran 200 yards one time. It was awful. Uh, I was forced to run miles. Hated it. Hated it. I was a short distance runner. But over time, if you train, you grow in your endurance. But you have to persevere. You have to learn to bear up under the suffering so that you may grow and mature. Do we accept the race that God has marked out? Or are we trying to run a different race that was not meant for us? I believe oftentimes we're, we're not running the race that God has marked out because we're still wrestling with God about the race that he's given us. And we say, God, why did you give me this race? We don't, we, we don't feel like that's what we deserved. We feel entitled to a, to a different race, a better race in our mind, an easier race. But the Bible says consider Jesus, imitate Jesus. And Jesus' race was to be totally innocent and then be crucified. Yet he prayed, he accepted the race, he allowed the crucifixion, and he became like God, because he's God in the flesh. Have we accepted our race? I believe when we don't accept our race, we allow into our life resentment, and we allow into our life bitterness. And then these become the sins and the hindrances that entangle us and prevent us from running. What are we focused on? What motivates us? When you learn to drive a car or, or ride a motorcycle, 
they teach you that you always look where you want the motorcycle to go. So if you're riding your motorcycle and then you see a wall, the worst thing you can do is get fixated on the wall. Because guess what happens next? You drive your motorcycle into the wall. And this is a real thing. And so they tell you when you're learning to drive, they say, don't look at the things that you're trying to avoid. As soon as you see those obstacles, you have to get your eyes fixated on where you need to go. What are you fixated on? What are you focusing on? When you read the Bible in the morning, when you pray in the morning, does it change what you focus on? Are you allowing God to change your focus so that you can run the race he has for you? God is calling us to set our heart and our mind on Christ. Point number two is admonition. Go to verse four. Point number one is determination. Point number two of the lecture is admonition. Verse four. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And you have forgotten the word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. And do not lose heart when he rebukes you. Because the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of our spirits and live? Our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Point number two is admonition. Jesus never gave up even to the point of shedding his blood on the cross. And yet how often in our lives when things get difficult, do we give up and justify quitting? We say God would never want it to be this hard. Well, if God wanted Jesus to be crucified and Jesus was sinless, how could we be entitled spiritually to anything more than that? Now, I think in God's grace, he doesn't even put us through that. But he's building our character. He's building our maturity. And he warns us two things. He says, number one, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. This is the first way that we can go wrong. When God allows the hardship and discipline in our life, when our physical fathers disciplined us, the first way that we can go wrong is we make light of it. We make light of it. I remember times when, when I was young and, and my father would begin to discipline me and I would make light of it. And instead of laughing along with me, the wrath of my father would increase and increase and increase until I realized that what he was telling me was serious. How many times has God intervened in our life and brought discipline and we have tried to act like what he's teaching us doesn't matter? Or we laugh it off. We don't allow it to change our spirit. We don't allow it to build conviction. We don't allow it to change our character and mold us and make us like Christ. But we rationalize and we justify and we defend and and we deflect and we say, well, maybe uh, what my friends told me is true or maybe what we do in in society is better than what God says. And we say, impurity, immorality, (laughs) that's stupid. Everybody does that. We make light of it. God intervenes, he brings the pain, and that's what happens when you live the sinful life. And if you make light of it, he'll intervene again, and it'll get a little bit more painful. If you still make light of it, he'll intervene again, it's going to get a little bit worse. And the pain will continue until we accept the lesson. The first warning. The second warning is do not lose 
heart. That is the moral courage. The moral courage. When we face opposition, what we learn from our dad is you do not back down. You do not back down. But you say, if this is what is right, then I fight for it for God and my family. This is what I do because this is what God does for me. God disciplines us, the Bible says, because he loves us. But why do we give in to the lie that pain and discipline must be a sign that God is distant from us? That is actually a sign that he's with you. However, if you don't accept the discipline, you push him away. Just like we did to our physical fathers when we rebelled against their rules and commands. My family was asking me, what do you want for Father's Day? I said, you know what, just obey everything I say for one day. I'll be super fired up. God's love language is obedience. Obedience. When you feel the intervention of God in the form of pain and suffering, that's God drawing you closer to make you more like Christ. And by rebelling against it, you say, God, I don't want to be with you. We should probably apologize to our dads who tried to help us those many times we were growing up. Pain is a good thing if you're mature. Pain is a good thing if you're mature. Verse 11 says, no discipline seems pleasant at the time. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace. The man who produces righteousness and peace in his life is a man who has accepted his race. The man who does not produce righteousness, but produces unrighteousness. The man that does not produce peace, but produces division and disorder is the man who has not accepted his race. It is the man pushing away the discipline of God. Admonishment is part of who God is. And it is an essential value of fatherhood. When we remove admonition from a relationship with God or even from what it means to have a father or to be a son or be a daughter, we're removing an essential ingredient to what it means to have a relationship and to be mature. Admonition is loving. It is an act of love. When my son Ethan or my daughter Adrian is over there fiddling with the power outlet, guess what gentle, kind, and loving daddy does? He intervenes urgently and with firm conviction. I don't want you to be electrocuted. Stop what you're doing right now. You are never allowed to do that again. When my daughter tries to open the oven that my wife is, has turned on to bake dinner, what do you think loving and gentle daddy does? Immediately intervenes with firm conviction. You will never do that again. Now they might not react in a way where they understand the love at that moment, but praise God, they won't be electrocuted. Praise God, they won't be burned. And if they don't listen, eventually they will be electrocuted. Or they will be burned. And they'll remember what God tried to teach them through their dad. Pain will teach you if you let it. It is God's way to admonish us. We need to ask ourselves on Father's Day, are we open to the admonition of God? Do we invite accountability in our life? Do we invite it? Do we appreciate it? 
do we immediately show our gratitude for it? Sometimes we wound ourselves simply by our own rebellion. Our wounds are not the wounds of the one that tried to discipline, but they are self-inflicted because of our rebellion. And so we must learn to love the correction that God gives us. Does hardship in your life drive you closer to God or away from him? What happens when the pain comes? How do you handle it? And ask yourself, what am I producing in my life? Peace and righteousness or chaos and sin? We must allow God to train us. The last quality of fatherhood that God is teaching us is devotion. Go to verse 18. Hebrews 12, verse 18. Devotion. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire to darkness, gloom, and storm, to a trumpet, trumpet blast or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that, they know fur, that no further word be spoken. And he's talking about the Israelites around Mount Sinai. Because they could not bear what was commanded. Verse 22. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. It's talking about the church of Christ. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all men, to the spirits of righteous men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. It's the blood of Jesus Christ. Verse 28, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful. And so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. The last quality essential to fatherhood is devotion. You know, one of the best lessons I learned as a child was to have a healthy respect for my parents. Because it was that healthy respect, and, and sometimes it comes in a for, the form of fear. The fear of discipline. It was that respect and that fear that allowed me to honor them and listen to their instruction. God is encouraging us through the discipline that he gives us to become reverent. To become reverent. God wants to produce in his children reverence and awe. That is the heart of devotion. The truth is, if you are a Christian, if you are a baptized disciple of Jesus Christ, then you have not been baptized in the blood of Abel. You have been baptized in the blood of Jesus. And it is through the grace of God that you have been entered into a relationship with God himself. So that when you die a physical death, you might enter into the physical presence of God in heaven as he sits on his throne. And you better come into God's presence with some reverence and all. And so God is preparing you for that now so that you don't make the mistake when you enter into eternity. You have not been baptized into your leadership. You have been baptized into Jesus Christ. It's not revering man or revering the church, although the church is the body of Christ. It's revering the power and the grace of God and therefore honoring one another. The Bible is so clear. We cannot disrespect the words of the living God. You know, the word devotion, the definition is the fact or state of being ardently dedicated or loyal. Ardently dedicated or 
loyal. This means that your loyalty to God cannot be shaken. Your loyalty to God is so strong that no matter what happens, nobody can tear you away from him. Nothing can tear you away from him. You will fight for God. You will fight for the spiritual family of God no matter what happens to you. Isn't that what a father does? If a father leaves the family because how the family treats them, what kind of father is that? But how many people run away from the church? instead of fighting for it. You know, we didn't enter into a nice social atmosphere. You don't come to church for you. You come to church for God. Did you know that, my brothers and sisters? How devoted are we to God's word? Are we students of the Bible or just fans of the Bible? What does it mean to have a quiet time when you wake up in the morning? Is a quiet time a time to learn more about the scripture? Yes. But if you learn more about the scripture and you're not more committed, more devoted, more reverent, more loyal, then have you had a quiet time? Have you really read the Bible? If you're irreverent in front of God Almighty, I'd have to question it. Eagerly examine every day. Why? Why? So that you can defeat people in arguments? Is that why you eagerly examine the Bible? So that you can look smarter than other religious people? Or is it because you actually care about the family of Christ? You actually care and you love God and you revere God and you're going to fight for it even if it means the shedding of your own blood. How do we read the Bible? Where is our loyalty? Christianity today is so divided because of a lack of reverence, family. That is the root of it. It is a lack of reverence. When someone works to divide the church, when someone runs away from the spiritual family, do not be confused. It is because of a lack of reverence for God Almighty. Why is Father's Day important? Because the value of a father lies not in the man, but in the values of fatherhood planted there by God. That's why Father's Day is important. Love, loyalty, commitment, hard work, responsibility, maturity, strength, moral courage. Satan is striking the father to scatter the family. Are you going to value fatherhood? That's what I want to call you to this morning. You know, if you take the D from determination, the A from admonition, and the D from devotion. I think what we learned from our lecture this morning is that it's good to be a dad and we have to honor our dads and the best dad and the best role model is our heavenly dad. Amen? To God be the glory. I love you guys. We're going to stand up and sing one final song. Well, hey. uh, this All right, let's rise up. Let's sing one final song.